Um, hello, hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to St. Paul's Cathedral. My name's Elizabeth Foy. I'm the head of adult learning here. Welcome to uh, friends of long standing and people who haven't been here for a long time and new friends. Um, I, it's my, been my joy and my privilege to put on the events here, and there's a particular pleasure. Um, today to introduce the canon Dr. Edmund Neal, da, 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 who <laughs> is the um, principal of Cumberland Lodge, a place of great beauty physically and intellectually in um, Windsor Park, um, where he, he directs a programme inquiring into the most serious things about our age, about politics and ethics and economics and theology with great lightness and great alarm and great depth. And today he's going to talk about this, I am going to tell you, marvellous book about the Sacramental Sea, um, which has great depth and understanding about, about why some of us, so many of us, are drawn to the sea as a place of spiritual encounter and, and runs through the history um, of that extraordinary human instinct to do that. And it's a particular pleasure for me because Ed, uh, before doing that, and then went to Christchurch, Oxford, and um, before that was the Canon Chancellor here, 10, 11 years ago, and um, an important person in my life, he appointed me, so that was marvellous for me, <laughs> and then we worked together for five years at St Paul's Institute doing ethics and economics, and that was a conversation that was very formative for me, a conversation of four or five years about about the things that matter most uh, to us as human beings and as a society. And I'm very grateful for that to Ed. So it's a lovely thing today to welcome him back to come and talk about the Sacramental Sea. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. If there's time at the end, I might just tell you about the interview when uh, <laughs> pointed uh, Elizabeth, but uh, that's when the cameras aren't rolling. Uh, it's wonderful to, to be back at St Paul's and it's really appropriate that I'm talking about this book here. And in fact, we all ought to just get up and walk right up to the top of the dome to the Golden Gallery because that's where this book started. So what happened was in uh, 2007 when I was here, um, I was asked to lead the Radio 4's Sunday worship, so, well, Easter sunrise service. Uh, for Easter Day and they wanted me to do a reflection on London from the top of St Paul. So I did my homework, I went out, I stood on the Golden Gallery and uh, soaked in the atmosphere, went home and uh, wrote the first draft of my script and then I showed it to my wife uh, to say, what do you think of this? And she said, you can't broadcast that, you'll make everyone depressed. So I thought, yeah. <laughs> So I, I read through the script and thought, yes, she's absolutely right. Because basically what I was saying was, what a fantastic view of London you get from the top of uh, St Paul's Cathedral. But actually what does it for me spiritually isn't looking out over a city, it's standing on a cliff looking out to sea. And the redeeming feature for me was looking down on the Thames, seeing it weaving through the city. And that started me to think, you know, why, why did I instinctively uh, put that in this script? So uh, anyway, I adjusted the script, so I hope people weren't depressed on, on Easter Day. But then the next thing that triggered, uh, triggered this book was actually Evensong here. And I was, I'd been thinking about the sea as a result of that experience upstairs. And then I was listening to the reading at Evensong, and we had um, an extract from the book of Revelation. Revelation 21.1 uh, came out. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And that sort of really resonated with me. I thought, this is about the new creation, where we're hopefully eventually going, and God recreates the cosmos, and there's no more sea. I thought, ah, you know, I love being by the sea. Uh, why in the Bible um, is the sea portrayed negatively? So I had two questions that started to, to come bubble up and also I think a paradox. So the two questions were, why do so many people like me find it extremely spiritual to be by the sea? Why is there a sort of spiritual attraction? But at the same time, if you look in the Bible, there are many, many negative references to the sea. How do you square these two things together? 
So that was um, the starting point of the book. And I should say that the book took 11 years to write. I can't promise I was writing it every day, because if I did, it would have worked out at six words a day. But, um, but in fact, spending 11 years reflecting, reading, and really engaging with it was, was really helpful. If I belted the thing out uh, quickly, I really think it would have been uh, not such a good book. So, let's start just with the Bible um, to try to contextualize it. Now, we could spend hours studying the sea in the Bible, so what I want to do is cut to the chase uh, for, for this purpose and to say why fundamentally the sea is portrayed negatively. And it really starts off right at the very beginning of the Bible with the book of Genesis. So I'm just going to read uh, some of the opening of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. So what we're seeing right at the beginning of Genesis is an image of the pre-created state. Earth, a formless void, formless void, and then the deep, this primordial mass, this primordial ocean that's existing there. And then the creation account goes on like this. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separate the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And so it was, God called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Okay, so now God is bringing order out of chaos and we see these waters are being separated. And then it goes on. And God said that the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and God saw that it was good. Now, I'm just going to pass around a handout because, so you can just visualise what's uh, going on. So maybe if Elizabeth does that side, I do this side. So if you look at the top diagram, um, this, one, this one here, this is a representation of the ancient cosmology that lies behind uh, the book of Genesis when we see the creation. So this is how many of the ancients in the Middle East perceived how the cosmos was, was formed, or it was, was structured. So you can see that we've got, the waters have been separated, we've got waters under the earth, and we've got um, waters above the firmament. So the firmament is this dome that was believed to be there. The sky was believed to be this dome, which had windows, or lattices. So the idea was that when it rained, when it snowed, when the hail came, these lattices were opened up and water would drop in. And what you can see is also, when it's been separated, there's this vast amount of water that spreads out to the side, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But the seas are the bits of water that you can see popping up between the earth, the seas and the rivers, that's how it was all perceived, that those bits of, um, those little bits here, jutting up, were perceived as, as the seas. And that's how the ancient thought world um, perceived the, the structure of the cosmos, or well, certainly the, the thought world out of which Genesis came. Now, when you look at the Bible, and I suppose the, one of the most famous stories about the sea in the Bible is Noah's flood, one of the things to understand about that is that what we're seeing explained there is that God allows a return to chaos. So this is the created order, where the seas have been, waters have been separated for the flood. God punishes humanity by allowing a temporary restoration of the pre-chaos, uh, the pre-creation state where chaos reigns. So we get water coming back down from above and coming up from under, underneath. And that is, again, the thought world that existed in that time. That's how the, the flood were, was perceived to be. And then God 
does the reverse. He goes back and separates them again, goes back to that created state. So what we're seeing in Genesis is the idea of creation, not necessarily creating out of nothing, but much more about God being in control of <coughs> what exists. And for the ancient thought, well, the most powerful force they could perceive were the oceans, and God can control the oceans. And that lies behind so much of the thinking about the sea in the Bible. And we get reprises of it. And perhaps the most important reprise that we get from a Christian point of view is the idea of Jesus relating to water. We could spend a lot of time talking about the Sea of Galilee, not a sea, a lake. And interestingly, as far as we're aware, it was never referred to as a sea uh, in early times, except in the Gospels. So there's something odd going on there. But I, we might pick that up later on. But here's, here's uh, a passage from the Bible which really uh, says something powerful, and it's from uh, Matthew's Gospel. And when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so, the great, so great the boat was being swamped by waves. But he was asleep, and they went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of a man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What sort of a man is this? Well, this man has divine power. It echoes that understanding of Genesis that only God can control um, these massive elemental forces and Jesus can do the same. Jesus can walk on water as well. So that's the thought world that's there. And then when it gets Christianized, we start to see that thought world appearing in maps and they're called TO maps and we can see an example of a TO map here and if you look at the map of Mundi for example in Hereford Cathedral that's a, a variant on a TO map and essentially it represents uh, what we see above so Jerusalem the place of, Je of Jesus' resurrection that's the centre of the world so that's centralized in there. There were three known land masses for the uh, ancients in the Middle East, Asia, Europe and Africa, and they are represented uh, in the in the TO map, separated by the River Don, the River Nile and the Mediterranean. So it was all very much the thought world of uh, the, the Middle East. But you'll notice right round the edge is this ocean, this, the waters that are left are over from chaos. So the Don, the Nile, the Mediterranean, they're the seas, the rivers that God has created. The ocean round the edge is the, basically the leftovers from creation. It's what's, what remains. And also, tradition had it that the three great land masses were populated out of the children of Noah, Shem, Japheth and Ham. So that's why they're mentioned uh, there as well. So that's a theological thought world that, that develops as a consequence of that cosmology above. That's how it all starts to knit together. Now, of course, it's not factually correct, but this is how it was perceived in the time. Now, there are various things to say about it. One, one I just want to add is why did this sort of thinking develop? Well, I think a key to it is to understand the distinction between the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic. So if you're living in that part of the world, you will be familiar with the Mediterranean, which compared with the Atlantic is relatively tideless, relatively calm. The Atlantic is wild, and tidal and you just do not know what lies beyond it. It's perceived, Spain is perceived to be the end of the world and places like Britain are perceived to be on the edge of the world. 
So that's the sort of thought world that's going on. So um, if you know your geography, then when you look at the bottom there, the Mediterranean, those would be the pillars of Hercules uh, by Gibraltar. That's, that's, for them, was the end of the world. And if you uh, read um, the book of Noah, um, Noah goes to the end of the world and it's thought that he was actually going to a port in, uh, in what is now Spain. That was, again, the thinking behind it all. Now, that's the ancient thought world. Over 2,000 years, it's all changed. And I want to explain uh, how the thinking has changed. The first major factor to affect um, the thinking about the sea was quite obviously the sea travel. See, Christianity spread around the Mediterranean and, uh, and it required people to travel by sea. And quite naturally, they started to relate the sea um, to, uh, to, to the faith. So St. Paul, for example, travels extensively by boat and a lot of the language St. Paul uses actually picks up maritime, uh, maritime images, although that's often lost in translation today. But a lot of the St. Paul's thinking was around that. St. Paul was a tent maker, may well have been a sail maker as well. So he's probably uh, deeply uh, influenced by, by uh, issues to do with the sea. Some of the great early theologians also picked up imagery of the sea and started to weave it into their theology. Probably the two most significant ones are St. Augustine, who was a lot of what he wrote about started to use sea imagery in a positive way to exp express his Christian views. And the other one was St. John Chrysostom. I'm just going to give one example of something St. John Chrysostom uh, wrote in one of his sermons. And he, he wrote this. He said, we wonder at the greatness of the sea and its measureless expanse, but terror and fear only seize upon us when we gaze down into its depths. So too here the psalmist, when he gazes down into the immeasurable, yawning depth of divine wisdom, dizziness comes upon him, and he recoils with terrified wonder. Okay, so we're starting to see the sea emerge in uh, Christian literature outside the Bible. Spreading, when Christianity spread around the Mediterranean, something else that happened was that what was essentially a Jewish sect started to interact with classical uh, philosophy. So it started particularly in Greece. So St. Paul and others go to, to uh, the Greek islands and they start to interact with thinkers from, who are steeped in uh, Greek philosophy. And in particular, one of the things that comes out of this is Neoplatonism. So Christianity, I, if you had to say, if you ask me what Christianity is sort of philosophically, I would say it's a sort of hybrid between, um, between Judaism and Neoplatonism. I think that's how it sort of developed in the, in the, in the early uh, part of Christian history. Neoplatonists were much more positive about the sea and they started to use images about uh, the sea as representing the divine and rivers representing the flow of humanity to the divine. And so we start to see in early Platonic thinking, or neo-Platonic thinking, the idea that we mingle with God, there's a sort of mystical union with God. And that, in a lot of the early Christian mysticism, uh, appears as well. So the idea that, that we're like water running to the sea, and when, and when we reach the sea, we, we mingle with it and the waters come together and, and God becomes, we, we, we interact with God in a very powerful uh, way. So that's another thing that starts to develop uh, in that period. And then Christianity spreads beyond the Mediterranean. And for me, one of the really interesting things is when it spreads to the British Isles. Because one of the things that happens then is that people genuinely believed that they were taking Christianity to the end of the world. They didn't know anything beyond it. They really did think that. And in some, uh, some thinking, believe, some pe people believe that because they'd taken Christianity to the ends of the world, the end of the world was about to happen. The second coming of Christ would come. 
So there's, a, there's an idea that now that the gospel is, is, is being spread as far as it could possibly go, Christ will return. And that affected a lot of thinking. And also what affected a lot of thinking was the idea of, um, of monasticism. So monasticism starts out in the Mediterranean in the desert, in sandy deserts, and then it starts to spread around outside the Mediterranean to where there's not a lot of sun and sand, but what there is, is a lot of water and islands. And so what we start to see is that affecting uh, the religious mindset as well. And some of the early Celtic um, missionaries and saints refer to finding uh, a desert in the ocean. A desert in the ocean. What they're thinking is they can get away uh, from the rest of humanity and they can find a place on the edge of the world where they are fulfilling God's mission about bringing about the second of coming of Christ and they can do it in a location where they are being spiritually tested because they're as far away from God as possible. They're on the edge of chaos. And that's a really, very really powerful uh, force in early monasticism and in early um, Christianity uh, in the British Isles. One place that is worth going to, some of you may have been there, is Skellig Michael in, on the west coast of, of Ireland. It's like a mountain peak sticking out of the Atlantic. And for six centuries, monks lived there. It's probably got more famous recently because it's been used as a set for Star Wars. So you can see Luke Skywalker uh, coming out of a monk's cell. But for six centuries, um, monks lived there in this dramatic remote location. And it really, for me, sums up that sort of ancient thought world that they've come to the end of the earth uh, and it's a place of spiritual testing um, and you can imagine them thinking about the, the end times when they're there. But a more recent pilgrim to this place, the poet David Scott, I'm just going to quote the end of a poem he wrote about Skellig Michael because it really is an extraordinary, powerful place. And David Scott wrote, Stop, breathe, let in the peace, and if you don't kneel there, where on earth will you kneel? So it is a really powerful spiritual place. I need, to, because of time, I need to make a bit of a leap to, uh, uh, from, from that spread of Christianity uh, around the British Isles until it spread much further afield in the age of discovery. And the person I want to just talk about briefly is someone we'd all have known and studied at school, Christopher Columbus. One of the things that fascinated me about writing this book was to discover more about Christopher Columbus's religious thought world. It's very, a very simplistic idea of Columbus is here's someone who's out to discover places, is out to get wealth, and so he sails uh, west. What Columbus was almost certainly doing, and he writes about it in an extraordinary book that he co-authored um, with a Carthusian monk, and the, the book is called Book of Prophecies, explains the religious thinking that, uh, that Columbus had. Columbus wasn't setting out to discover new territory. Columbus was trying to find a route to Asia by sailing west rather than traveling east. The reason why he was doing this was because he didn't want to pass through Islamic territory. This was quite soon after uh, Islam had conquered um, Constantinople and became Istanbul and Tensions were high be between Christians and Muslims at this time. What Columbus wanted to do was find a route to Asia. He'd read the works of Marco Polo, who had described great wealth in Asia. So he wanted to find a way of getting there. And he had an inkling that if you went west, you would get there. And he knew that the, the earth was, was spherical. And so he knew that if you travelled 
far enough you would get there eventually, somehow. Not quite sure how, but he, he had a hunch that you could sail there by sea. So that's what he, he was out to do. And the reason why he wanted to get to this wealth wasn't for personal gain. What he wanted to do was fund a crusade, fund what he perceived would be the final crusade when he would be able to fund uh, an assault on Jerusalem, which was in Islamic control, and bring it under Christian control. And he too thought he was living in the end times. And he thought that if he achieved this, he would bring about the second coming of Christ. Now, it all sounds rather extraordinary, but this is, this is his thought world. And this is what he writes about in the book of prophecies. And you can see exactly where he's coming from when you, when you read that book. And it's almost certain that Columbus died thinking that he had uh, reached Asia. Um, he'd reached Cuba, he thought he'd reached Asia, and he, was, he, he died convinced of that. He also, one of the preconditions about, uh, that, about bringing about the second coming in the thought world that he inhabited was rediscovering the Garden of Eden. It was perceived to be a, a precursor of the second coming of Christ. So he thought one of the Caribbean islands that he'd landed on was the Garden of Eden. It wasn't, but there we are, he thought it was. But that sort of strange thought world was, was very uh, prominent. But what it started to do, of course, is that no longer was the Atlantic seen as this sort of rim of chaos around the, the edge of the, of the world. Suddenly, it becomes this amazing uh, trade route and, and op source of opportunity for travel and, and mission to take the gospel much further afield. So one of the, the key things of this period is the development of this expansion uh, further afield. One of the people who was deeply struck by all this was someone very closely associated with, with this place, John Dunn, the former Dean of St. Paul's. And um, I'm just going to quote very briefly a poem that Dunn wrote shortly before his death. And this, he says this, Whilst my physicians by their love are grown, cosmographers, and I their map, who lie flat on this bed, that by them may be shown that this is my southwest discovery, per fret and febris, by these straits to die. So what he's describing is the doctors studying his body while he's laid out in bed, um, like cosmographers. They're sort of uh, they're studying his body, trying to work out what's going on while he's lying on his bed. And he refers to this, my southwest discovery. And what he's referring to is the discovery of the Magellan Strait, which uh, links, the, um, links the, the Atlantic with the Pacific. And that southwest discovery takes us through to the east. And so what he's almost certainly alluding to is that he's moving from the west, and we associate the western skies with the sun setting and with death, to the east, to the Pacific, which gets associated with sun rising and resurrection. So Dunn is totally steeped in this sort of, and you can read it in all sorts of his poems and sermons, references to, to this. Dunn also was a colonialist, and I refer to some of the less pleasant things he writes about, about colonialism in, in the book. So we're starting to see attitudes to the sea changing as a result of the age of discovery. Two more influences um, to mention rather briefly. One is the Enlightenment. So we're moving in, in time a couple of hundred years later. The world, we're, our understanding of the world is changing dramatically and including scientifically. Interestingly, people didn't understand the water cycle properly until the 18th century. Lots of theories about how water circulated, but it wasn't until um, the 18th century, late 17th, early 18th century, that it really was properly understood. And it was first correctly described, as far as we're aware, by a Cambridge mathematician, uh, John Kyle. And he correctly described what was going on. And this was also a time where many scientists were also 
interested in theology. So um, people like Robert Hooke, Robert Boyle, Isaac Newton, all these people, they saw their science in rather theological terms. And this is what happened with the water cycle. So it starts to get theologized. So the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, had been the remnant of chaos. By now, not only has it become a route through to, to discover the rest of the world, it also becomes the source of fresh water because they understand now that water comes, condenses, comes over in clouds and drops down as fresh water and this is through the cyclical thing. So suddenly this chaotic mass that's around the earth suddenly takes on life-giving properties in, an, in a new way. I'm just going to quote one person who writes about that, John Wesley. So this is John Wesley describing the water cycle and he says, who has instructed the rivers to run in so many winding streams through vast tracts of land in order to water them so plentifully, then to disembogue themselves into the ocean, so making it the common centre for commerce, and thence to return through the earth and air to their fountainheads in one perpetual circulation? Well, it's a rhetorical question because he's saying this is God doing this. And in the thought world of the time, God, it's, it's, he, he's, it's God's providence. He sees all this natural cycle for our benefit, that God has created this cycle um, and it provides a way of transport, it provides us with fresh water, and so on and so forth. So that again starts to change the thinking uh, that's, going, that's going on. One final one to mention, um, and then I'll start to come towards the end, is Romanticism. So science affects it, but the arts also affect thinking as well. The Romantic movement springs up um, in the 18th century. It's not called the, Atlant uh, the Romantic movement at that time, but that's how we look back at it. And key to all this is the de development of the idea of the sublime. People like Burke, Talk, start to talk about the natural world in very positive ways where previously people would talk about the natural world in very negative ways. So things like mountains, oceans, things that have terrified people, they start to see a, f a form of beauty in this because they seem to stir up within us a sense of awe and wonder. And so we start to see positive reflections of this in uh, Romanticism. Just to give two brief examples of the effect of Romanticism. One is in poetry. Just about every major Romantic poet writes about the sea. Um, most famously, perhaps, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is deeply theological. We, we might touch on that in Q&A. Also in art. So artists like Turner um, pick up strongly on the sea. And I picked up on one of the Romantic uh, painters for the cover of the book. So on the, on the other side, you'll see uh, this image here. It's called Monk by the Sea by a German artist, Gasper uh, David Friedrich. And it really sums up a lot of what I was writing about. Here's, here's this monk standing on uh, a cliff looking out to sea and there's something deeply mystical about that image. It's very much one of the key um, German pictures of the Romantic uh, movement. So Romanticism starts to affect people's thinking. They get attracted to these wild places. They want to go by the sea, they want to go up mountains, and so on and so forth. But Romanticism's impact spreads also to Christianity, and in particular to hymn writing. And if you go through the English hymnal and look at hymns that refer to the sea, you will find a vast number of them, and many of them written um, in the late 18th, 19th century, the period of Romanticism. Romantic poetry is, is getting into the psyche of uh, hymn writers, and there are loads of them. I'm just going to quote one very briefly um, by 
Church of Scotland hymn writer George Matheson, Church of Scotland minister, O love that wilt not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give to thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths it flows, may richer fully be. That idea of flowing back uh, to the ocean. Neoplatonic, I mentioned it earlier on. Interestingly, Matheson had studied classics. Um, he'd studied Plato at, in, uh, at the University of Glasgow, and we start to see that sort of Neoplatonic image. And a lot of the Romantics were influenced by Neoplatonism as well. Five more minutes, then I will uh, stop. But I just wanted to, to bring things together because we've covered a lot of territory um, and we've gone chronologically. One of the things that I, that I really looked at in depth was accounts of people's religious experience. I was really interested in, do people honestly have religious experiences associated with the sea? There are two key sources for looking at this. One is a book by um, William James, who was the brother of Henry James, the writer. William James is a uh, psychologist and he wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience and looked in that a number of the accounts of religious experience he uh, writes about in the late 19th, early 20th century are to do with the sea. The other source that I looked at and in much more depth were the, was the database of the Religious Experience Centre, which initially was in Oxford University and then later got transferred over uh, to Lampeter. That was set up by Alistair Hardy, who was Professor of Zoology and a marine biologist at Oxford, a very distinguished marine biologist, who actually incidentally taught um, biology to Richard Dawkins. Um, so, interesting side. Um, but when he retired, he turned his attention to religious experience because when he was a teenager, Hardy had a religious experience next to water. And he, he promised himself that at some point in his life, he would put his academic mind around religious experience. So he did it when he retired as the professor of zoology at Oxford. And he sent out a national appeal for um, for people to fill in a form anonymously about religious experiences that they had. And 6,000 or so people responded to this. This was in the late uh, 1960s, early 70s. Uh, and then he analysed them. Well, I went through them as well uh, subsequently to look about, to see if I could find anything to do with the sea. And I did, I found a lot. And they fell into two very clear categories. And there was hardly anything other than these. One was um, feeling safe in the, f in the face of extreme danger at sea. So here's an example. I feel increasingly a sense of being guided and protected by a power beyond myself. This is applied to major events, as in the, in the sea off Dun Dunkirk in, 1940, in 1940, when I felt detached from events and assured that I was safe. So quite often sailors who were in, dis in difficult situations who suddenly found peace and a sense of God's presence with them. But by far the most were what's termed the oceanic feeling, a sense of connectedness with the divine. So I'm just going to read this one out uh, to you. And this is off the west coast of Wales. I was walking alone towards the sunset along the very fine cliffs and finally stopped and sat looking out to sea to watch the last moments of the sun's descent. I remember that the sky was immensely, profoundly blue and continued perfectly clear as the sun's light waned. And I distinctly recall this gave me a powerful sense of infinity, a reminder of huge tracts of space and galaxies many light years away. I also remember noticing the golden path of the sun on a calmish sea and the many signs around of the interaction of rock and water, the worn hollows and spines of one and the ceaseless movement of the other. It was from this observation that my mind began to move in the direction of religious thought. But that is perhaps a misleading way of expressing the fact. The strongest memory I have 
is of a conviction pressing in on my whole being, not merely my mind, that the creation in front of me, its elemental forces, its huge complexity, was not complete or self-sufficient, but that behind it, within it, was the creator or ultimate reality. So that's sort of experience that people have. So to bring everything together in a very brief way um, from a, quite a complex set of arguments is that what I argue in the book is that through history the sea has been highly sacramental. What I mean by that is not a sacrament like communion but uh, a pointer to a representation of God for many people. In a, something that's much stronger than metaphor. So it's metaphor, but actually goes beyond metaphor. So think deeper. For me, the person who best expressed it was Hilaire Belloc, the writer, who actually was also a very fine sailor. And he wrote a book about sailing around Britain called The Cruise of the Nona. And in it, he referred to the sea as the common sacrament of the world. So I'm actually just going to end with a passage that I wrote in the sacramental sea, which really sums up uh, what the argument is. Then I'll finish. So I write, over the centuries, a number of influential thinkers and writers have emphasized the sacramental dimension of creation, its ability, in the words of Michael Main, to mirror the divine. It was Belloc, however, who appreciated more than most the breadth and depth of the sea's sacramental nature. He understood that it could create vivid images to fire the imagination, as well as clear the minds to contemplate ultimate mysteries. That at one moment the sea can seem a boundless source of life, at another a vast barren wilderness. He understood too that the sea's capricious nature captures precisely the human condition with its varying moods and the questions these can throw up about the meaning of life and the nature of God. Such questioning highlights a distinctive aspect of the sea's sacramental nature, the problem of theodicy. On the one hand, the sea is vital to our existence. Its place in the hydrologic cycle ensures we are supplied with life-giving water. It is abundant source of food and increasingly a source of energy. It is something that gives pleasure and is life enhancing. And yet, at the same time, it is dangerous and deadly. Its capricious nature speaks of God as the giver and taker of life, who also permits suffering. There is nothing sentimental about the sea. Its dangers are too well known. Thank you very much. We've got, a bit, we've got a bit of time for questions, which is uh, a treat. Um, think of your questions while I frankly hog the first one. Sorry about this. Um, in, the, in the book, you do connect the rising sea levels to what you call a spiritual crisis. And um, that's opening a whole huge other area on top of all the huge other areas. But talk to us for a couple of minutes about, about what you think that is. What's happening with that? Spiritually. Spiritually, spiritually. yeah. I'll just tell a, a little anecdote before then. Um, when I was at St Paul's, one of the people that we worked with was uh, Tim Smith, um, set up the Eden Centre. I was on a train uh, going to Oxford from, from London uh, and my mobile phone went off. Whilst the mobile phone was off, a fight was happening uh, on the carriage between uh, some rugby supporters. So it was shouting, a punch-up going on, my phone went off I answered it, and it was Tim Smith who was asking whether um, we'd be interested in having uh, a sea level put on the side of St Paul's Cathedral to represent rising sea levels. I was trying to discuss this with him, and suddenly a, a hand came over the back of the seat, tapped me on the shoulder while all this hullabaloo was going on, and the person said, you're using your mobile phone, this is a quiet carriage. <laughs> so, so, sorry, I've got to put it away. Anyway, but... Um, that's by the by, but I never forget that. But one of the things I, I'm arguing uh, in the book is, and this is the sort of the, I suppose, the ecological message, is that if the sea, if we perceive the sea 
as being sacramental, as speaking of, of God, why on earth do we treat it so badly? Why do we treat the sea as, as a dump? But also, what do, the, the echo between the story of the flood and rising sea levels today seems to me to be a really powerful, powerful image that, that here we are trying to work our way out of, of climate change using human ingenuity, um, trying to control things beyond what we're capable of controlling. And it's understandable that we, we try to do that, obviously. Um, but ultimately, there are things beyond our control. But there are things that have been caused by human error. And we're seeing that now. And I wish people could see it. But I end the book, and I just find it, with, with, um, with Thomas Merton, the, the great um, spiritual writer. Merton um, read the book The um, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And Rachel Carson was actually a marine biologist. So it's inter interesting for this point of view that he entered into this discussion with, with her. And before Merton, shortly before Merton died, he decided he wanted to live by the sea. And he'd chosen a spot where he wanted to go because he felt that for him was his home. But also, around that time, he was writing to, to uh, Rachel Carson, having read Silent Spring. And this is what he said. Now, this, this is so relevant to today. He, he says this. He says, what I say now is a religious, not a scientific statement. That is to say, man is at once part of nature and he transcends it. In maintaining this delicate balance, he must make use of nature wisely and understand his position, ultimately relating both himself and visible nature to the invisible, in my terms, to the creator. In any case, to the source and exemplar of all being and all life. But man has lost his sight and is blundering around aimlessly in the midst of the wonderful works of God. It is in thinking that he sees in gaining power and technical know-how that he has lost his wisdom and his cosmic perspective. I'll just repeat that. So it, it is in thinking that he sees in gaining power and technical know-how that he has lost his wisdom and his cosmic perspective. And that sort of seems to me to be really very important spiritual take on, on, on mm. current issues. And I think it's where um, ecological theology really yeah. comes out. Thank you, thank you. So, anybody want to ask Ed a question about anything about this? Where he goes on holiday? <laughs> <laughs> Why he doesn't like the city? Well, I do, I do touch on that in, in there, and in fact, one of the things I touch on is, as it were, the, the more difficult side of John Donne, um, who's got some quite positive things to say about colonialism, uh, which, from our perspective, uh, may, st may seem abhorrent, but obviously he was a product of his, his times. Um, Columbus, uh, from what I've read about Columbus, was rather, well, was very disturbed by seeing the development of slave trade around for, for, as a result of what he was doing. Um, but obviously, it's, it's one of those dreadful things that suddenly a way of exploiting people suddenly be, develops as a, as a and um, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question, except it's saying that the slave trade is one of those really negative things that came out of, of that age of discovery and um, um, and that it deeply affected people. So someone like John Newton, for example, who writes about, so the, the, you know, the, the hymn writer, John Newton, who becomes uh, Amazing Grace, um, slave trader who then gets converted to Christianity during a storm uh, at sea 
he comes back and continues being a slave trader. And it's not until later on in his life that he, uh, he, he changes his view. Um, so many people's lives in the maritime industry were tied up with slave trading. It's just horrendous. Um, but I think when you talk about the, the positive uh, sense of freedom that the sea can, can bring through, through, uh, through spirituals, Yes, I mean, that's the, that's the other side of the, of the equation. For so many people, the sea became a source of freedom. So, so many people uh, who settled in America, for example, were escaping religious persecution in Europe. For them, the sea was uh, a source of freedom, escape um, from persecution. But at the same time, they were traveling the same ocean that slaves were being uh, transported on. It's very complex mix. So the paradox, the positive and negative side of the sea. I think the person that best sums it up is, the person I quote pretty early on, is the writer Joseph Conrad. Um, and uh, Conrad uh, says, uh, Odi et amo may well be the confession of those who consciously or blindly have surrendered their existence to the fascination of the sea. So love and hate. Um, I think we all have a love-hate uh, relationship with the sea. Uh, most people, I think, think do. Um, and there's something deeply attractive about it, yet it's terrifying and at the same time. And you can go out, you could go out having a nice time on, on a beach and suddenly you're in big, big trouble. So I remember uh, as, a, as a youngster taking a canoe out on the Bristol Channel and it was a wonderful afternoon, it was great, I was enjoying myself and suddenly it got choppy really quickly and, and I was way out of my comfort zone uh, and I paddled as fast as I could back to the shore, got flipped over by a wave, got dragged in uh, in front of a lot of people so I looked, looked pretty stupid but also you know I, it was scary, really very scary indeed and I think there's that combination of attraction and scariness that is so powerful about the sea and that's why I think it's such a strong uh, strongly sacramental because um, you know God can be really scary in our thinking as well as loving and uh, uh, God allows us to die and God gives us life so it's it's that mixture which I think is so so rich and powerful Yes, and uh, having just spent a few days in Venice, um, just got into that routine of, 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 sea, of, of water travel being the, the main route. I think, I think there could well be people that, what I would like, personally, what I would like to see is, and I'm sure it's being done, is more research on, um, on alternative energy f uh, sources for, for powering vessels and some sort of combination of solar and wind power um, which I think may well come out in, in the longer term and be a way of transporting these. I mean the sea, sea travel is, I mean, is, may not, most people fly um, but most goods are, are sent by sea um, because effectively it's a cheap warehouse. You can put the, the stuff in a, in, a, in a container ship and it can, uh, it can take weeks or months to cross from, from China or whatever, um, but it's a cheap warehouse. But I think that if, if we, we could use the 6C a lot more, I'm sure we could, and that would be, I think that would be a, a positive, positive move, as long as you don't get seasick. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and there are two there are two things that I struggled to find evidence for when I was writing this. One was sea baptism, and the other was sea burials. So I can't give you a proper answer to that. Um, one of the things that did fascinate me, though, 
and it's something anyone can do, is simply look in the Book of Common Prayer. Because if you look in the Book of Common Prayer, you'll find a whole section about being at sea, which include, I think they will include burial at, at, at sea. Um, and when the prayer book was revised in, uh, and we had the alternative service book and then common worship, not a, not, a, not a thing about the sea. So clearly people's mindsets had, had pushed the sea out of being sort of what, what is in our normal consciousness. And I guess today, if people get, decide they want to be buried at sea, it's, it's, it's quite a big, big deal. Uh, one of my old tutors, certainly, uh, he was a maritime historian, wanted to be uh, buried at sea. I think ended up having ashes sprinkled uh, in, the, in the English Channel. Um, but I, I don't know, and I'd like, to go, I'd like to go and do a bit of more research on that, because it's, it's those sorts of rites of passage that I, I struggled to find real evidence for. So thank you for the question. I'm sorry I can't answer it. <laughs> um, we've got time for one more. I don't think you have to answer that. Oh, oh good. good. <laughs> <laughs> Burial at sea. There is only two areas around the British coast where you can be buried at sea. Very expensive. About three times as much as you would for a normal burial, because that's what I want to do. So, where, where, can, where can we get buried at sea? Uh, somewhere in the Irish Sea, just above the Irish Sea. Yeah. Some, I don't know, somewhere along the East Anglia, but I know where I want to go, but that's all right, and I can get there. You can do that. And I can do that, but, but very limited. And it's, um, and a normal, normal, um, Funeral directors will put you in the right direction if you want. This may be too. May not want to answer this, but I'm just intrigued to know what's. Why? Why would you like to be buried at sea? Because I've always been. Just deeply. Because the sea moves me yeah. for my spiritual causes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, in all honesty, or still, or water of any description. If I'm. You know, you have problems in life. I will either go to the sea or go by uh, the rivers or lakes. Yeah. So, you know, so, and I find peace. Perfect peace. Thank you. Yeah. What a perfect note. What a perfect note to end. I'm sure the lady was not planted by Ed <laughs> to provide that absolutely perfect ending to the event. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>